लाइट बहुत कम है यार। Good evening uh, and welcome to all of you. We have in front of us a very exciting talk, actually. Um, we have with us a person who has a very unique set of um, experiences and background. Um, Mr. Naftali Bennett, who is currently the Minister of Economy and Diaspora Affairs of the State of Israel, um, is an entrepreneur. He started a company that uh, in 1999 with some friends that was sold in 2005. Uh, it was sold for 2005 for $145 million. It is now RSA security, so it actually is uh, focused on anti-fraud software. So very successful entrepreneur. He is also um, was a commander in one of the Israeli Defense Forces most elite units, so he also has a background from the army. And most recently, he's, he's been in public service. He was a former leader of the opposition uh, and also currently is obviously a minister. So a very wide set of experiences, really unique for, for speakers here. Uh, we do have uh, people who've, who've made all kinds of contributions in one area, but it's rare that it's, it's in three areas that uh, somebody has made uh, a big contribution. So I think it's going to be very um, a delightful experience for the students and other people sitting in this in this uh, in this room to hear about your experience with, with innovation and entrepreneurship and your perspective on taking uh, an idea to application in the Israeli context. Israel, of course, is is really known for uh, high tech entrepreneurship and high tech successes of many different kinds. So I think it's both you're going to hear about a combination of his experiences in a country where the ecosystem really supports and thrives. Uh, and brings forth innovation. Uh, at the end of the talk, uh, the minister will be happy to take questions, but preferably from students. I think his main purpose here is to interact with students. So I, I, would, I would urge, actually, uh, the people here to let the students have the first chance of asking the questions. Can I also ask people to switch off their mobiles so that we can actually have an interruption-free uh, conversation? Uh, with that, over to you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be at IIT. I have my own uh, history with IIT, I'll tell you. Um, in the year, I want to say 2002, um, my company merged with an Indian company. An Israeli company merged with an Indian company. So just imagine what a group of Indians and Israelis all in a room in New York can do together. And the sky is the limit, and the sky was the limit uh, together. So it's great to be here. My, my Indian friends were all graduates of IIT, and they told me 
how big shots they are, so now I know. <laughs> um, I also feel very much at home here because uh, in many ways, uh, Indians are, are very much like uh, Israelis. We, we both have uh, very ancient histories, yet we're looking forward, uh, very much focused on education. You know, the, the Jews were dispersed around the world for many, many years, kicked out from one state into another. So in that sort of situation, you don't want to invest in land or in property. You invest in your child's brains. So 2,000 years of that, uh, did, did something uh, good and, and ultimately we, we very much like you uh, respect uh, education and the future and the family uh, value and uh, there's one more thing we, we have um, sort of a similar um, way of going about things I'll tell you what it's called it's called Jugad right? <laughs> Uh, I think there's only two languages in the world, two countries in the world that even know what that means. It's in Israel and Indians. We both know what Jugad is, and when there's no Jugad, we're left with God. <laughs> so what, what I want to share with you is, is really, um, I'm not going to talk about macroeconomics and all of that stuff. It's a bit boring. We're going to talk about what is in store for you and what you folks can do. Ladies and gentlemen, there's not enough ladies here, but I understand we're making some progress. Um, because I was sitting exactly in your chair just about uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, studying and, and sort of the world was uh, ahead of us. And I want to share with you the, the, primarily the mistakes uh, I made and lessons learned from a very tumultuous period uh, in, uh, in the high-tech arena. So I'll tell you our, our story and the mistakes we made, and then uh, I'll, I'll keep it fairly short and have as much possible time for any question you want on uh, entrepreneurship. So we were four folks, three uh, guys and a girl in Israel, um, and we decided to found a company. This was 1999. In fact, we didn't have an idea. We didn't have an idea, but we got together and decided we're going to found a company, and we got into um, you know, a room of the father of one of the founders, and for about four weeks, we would huddle, look at an idea, analyze it for a few days, go scout, get the information, come back and decide, go, no, go. We had a few ideas that were no, go, until finally we zoomed in. There was something fairly new back then called e-commerce, um, and the... Uh, you, you bought with a credit card as you do today, but there was a lot of fear in the market about buying with credit cards. So we came up with an idea that each time you buy at, say, Amazon.com, and this was all going on in Israel, uh, you would be granted or issued a one-time use credit card number, good for one transaction only, and at the end of the transaction it would expire. So if a hacker hacks into Amazon's net database, they'll get a bunch of nonsense. Of, of uh, expired credit cards, if you will. And we were convinced this is the smartest idea since the wheel. And uh, we, we went out starting uh, trying to raise money. But one, one lesson, even now, it, by the way, this utterly failed. We, we raised money, I'll tell you in a moment, but it was a catastrophe in the market. We got nowhere, and I'll tell you the story in a moment. But my main point is, the single most important decision you can make in the whole history of your venture is who's your partner. It's by far more important than what's the nature of the venture, what product, what strategy, because product and strategy change. Almost by definition they change. It's almost inevitable. I'm not saying always, but you know, you all know the 3M that started uh, with mining and that has post-its. The one constant is that amazing people can do amazing things and mediocre can't get things done. And the type of partner that I would look for, uh, it, it's not only a matter of personal traits, it's a matter of being inclined 
to entrepreneurship, you look for someone, certainly he's got to be really smart, okay, there's no compromise here, but someone who's committed and is not doing a sort of testing the water. You can't test the water. In entrepreneurship, you jump and you hope there's water in the pool. You can't sort of dip in, dip out because it's so tough that once you reach the first obstacle, you're going to leave if you're not fully committed. So there, I don't believe in half-time entrepreneurship. It's either you leave everything else and preferably at your age, where you don't yet have a family and all of the commitments. I'm not saying it's impossible to have three kids and, and become an entrepreneur, but it's mighty tough. If I had the, the, the babies crying and I'd have to go feed them, I, I was then uh, just married but no kids, and that was tough. Um, so full commitment, you want an egoless person. The ego is, is one of the, our biggest enemies. So if, if it's a person who cares about credit, so, you know, wants to, everyone to know that it was him who thought of the idea, that's a, a big no-go. You want someone who's only committed to the success of the venture and not greedy, doesn't care about his size of the pie. And I'll digress one moment about that. The size of the pie or the size of your slice in the pie. This is a, a vital lesson. So. Let's say, I'm, I'm talking about money for a moment, or, or the value. When you start a venture, its value is zero. And as you progress, its theoretical value grows. Imagine a, a pie that grows and grows, and you have a certain portion of the pie. Certainly, at the beginning, the, the pie is very small, because it can be an idea, and then when there's money funded, that's the money grows the value, the first customer grows the value, and so on and so forth. What I've seen too many times is early stage entrepreneurs focused on the size of their slice as opposed to the size of the pie. That's a disaster. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if it's a wild success, whether you have 7% uh, or 7.8% is irrelevant. And, and there's always a next time. There's always a next time. And if it fails, it doesn't matter if you had 7 or 7.8 or 15% for that matter. So in the initial stages of a startup, you sort of have nothing. You have one thing. You have equity or theoretical equity that you can hand out in return for things you need to get done because you don't even have money. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. As we were raising money, the VC funds, the venture capital funds, told us, who are you? And you know, none of us knew anything about credit cards. Not one of us was a software expert, and I was the, you know, the business guy, supposedly. Supposedly. Um, so we wanted credibility. We went to one of the world's leading uh, security software experts, encryption experts. His name is Professor Adi Shamir. You know the RSA encryption? So S is Shamir. Um, we made the pitch, and then we offered him equity, because we didn't have money. Now, it's, we, we, we were very uh, generous, but there was an argument inside, should we give him 1% or 3%? Who cares? It's 3% of nothing. Now, if it becomes something, it's a lot due to Adi Shamir joining, so let be very generous. Be generous with equity. That's my point. Don't start and when you need talent you don't have a lot of money at the beginning you want to give a low salary high equity as the company becomes more and more valuable you want to lower the equity portion and you can be a bit more generous on, on money a few words about raising money it's tough the vcs aren't nice uh vcs venture capital right so a, a few mistakes we made what one mistake was uh of the VC said, this is exciting, and we thought he meant it. You know, so he says, this is exciting. What he actually meant is, I want you to engage with, with us, stop working with other VCs, I'll capture you, and then you won't have any other options, and I'll be able to get great terms if I decide to invest in you. That's what I'm excited means, okay? And the, the corollary is, you never wanna 
go down the route of one potential investor. You always want to hit on about seven or eight different investors in parallel, not in a path, but at the same time, for two reasons. A, many of them will drop out, and you want to be left with at least two viable options, and B, you create the competitive uh, pressures. You can't bluff competition. If you have a VC in your pocket, you'll have the confidence that, that shows you have another alternative in your pocket. Um, also, you want to have a very quick graph where you learn. So what we would typically go, never go in alone, and never, by the way, never found anything alone. Don't do it on your own. Uh, this is a general statement. It's so tough. It's so emotionally tough. Uh, I, would, I think the, the, you know, the optimal number is three or four. Two is okay. Never try and do this thing alone. Um, they say that in movies sometimes, don't try this at home, so don't try this alone. And um, what we would go in, one person would write all the comments and, and mistakes made th that we need to improve next time, or surprise questions. So we'd, ha we'd have a document that's, that would, uh, it would be a live document of all the toughest questions that you really don't want to be asked, but you're always asked. And it's always better to prepare than uh, do the... Uh, what's it called? Jew? Yeah, Jugad. You don't want to Jugad that. You want to know in advance. And, and that way, very rapidly, after your third meeting, you've sort of heard most of the questions, so your fourth meeting uh, works out well. Um, we got the money. We were living in Israel. The, the, obviously, Israel was not a big market. We're only... Uh, eight million people now there. So we, I moved to the United States, to this big city called New York, and we started uh, running and, and selling the product. We tried to sell the product. It, it was a product sold to credit card issuers, banks. The sales cycle we thought would be four months was actually almost two years to get a sale done, uh, which is very tough. And ultimately we failed. The, and we, and we raised more money. Um, it turned out that there was an Indian com competitor and there was an Irish competitor. They were ahead of us. So the few issuers, bank, banks that did buy a system, bought it from our competitors. We also brought in a, a big shot American CEO because who are we to manage a company? And a year into it, we, we were running at about 70 employees, about $1 million run rate, meaning expenses per month, zero revenue, one customer. <laughs> All right? Now, we had this pattern. Uh, we had an Excel with our forecast. And every month, when we saw we were slipping, we would do something really easy. We would copy and paste it and move it one cell to the right. And, and we would say, all we need is to get all of this done, but it wouldn't happen. And in retrospect, this, is, this, was one, this almost brought us uh, to the ground. It almost killed us. And I think um, in retro, what, what we did at that point, I, I replaced the CEO. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think that we guys can do a good job. We don't need uh, the big shot. Uh, CEOs from America, certainly not at early stages, early stages for a few reasons. First of all, no one cares about the company more than us. We found that it's our baby. The CEO sees an upside, he might come, but he's sort of like that entrepreneur. He can try it out, it's not the end of his world, it's the end of our world if, if it fails. And it's not, but it feels that way. Secondly, no one knows more about our product. And it seems to me that Indians and Israelis are, are uh, more flexible and, and uh, you know, about things than sort of uh, getting stuck. But we have to be very adaptive. The second thing I did was I had to fire two-thirds of my company, down from 70 employees to about 22, 23 employees in one fell swoop. That was a horrible day, uh, but we had to do it. And third, we dumped the product. And at, at that point in time, there was this new phenomenon starting called phishing, pH phishing, 
which this I'm talking about year 2002, uh, fraudulent emails pretending to be your bank and phishing your details. You're all doing this. It was new then. Um, it, it had very little to do with what we we were already doing. Um, well, w one more point I, 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 I uh, put in here. We dedicated about half a year to thinking of new products. And we formed four subcommittees. Each one analyzed the product, the business case, the upside, the downside. And after these few months of, of work, the result was nothing. We analyzed it to death. And we were sort of stuck with this dying product. And, and here's a, a defining moment in our history. So this phishing stuff started. We got together the founders and we looked at it. We said, can we solve this somehow? Can we help the banks do something? Spent the day thinking about it and we decided to open up a 20